Some of you will remember the name Liz Carpenter. She was in the Johnson White House, was Mrs. was Lady Bird Johnson's social secretary, among other things, wrote some of LBJ's better speeches, like the Johnson's. She was originally from uh, Texas. And after the White House years, Liz wrote a book called Ruffles and Flourishes. And she was on book tour, as I am now, promoting her book, and was in Atlanta, Georgia one night when by chance she met her former White House colleague, Arthur Schlesinger, in the lounge of the hotel. And Arthur said to Liz, Gee, Liz, that was a great book of yours. Who wrote it for you? <laughs> she said, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Arthur. Who read it to you? <laughs> um, I think the announcement indicated I would be talking about my newest book, Breaking New Ground, which is an autobiography, and as I tried to think about this this afternoon in the hotel before coming over, I realized that talking about me is not something that, I, that I'm very comfortable doing. So I'm going to talk about the, the world food prospect and some of the things that are affecting food security at the global level. And if during the Q&A session, you would like to ask questions about the autobiography um, or anything else at the, at the personal level, I'd be happy to res respond to it. But, but I, I think the, the food security issue is being greatly underestimated, and I'll explain some of the reasons why. We know in looking back at earlier civilizations that, whose archaeological sites we now study, that more often than not, food was the, was the weak link for them, it's what brought the, the civilization down. For the Sumerians, the problem began with their irrigation system where they built dams and, and um, uh, uh, to store the river water and then a series of gravity-fed canals so the water could, could move out um, and be used for irrigation. But what happened was that with, with so much water being used for irrigation, some of it evaporated, some of it was used by crop, some of it um, percolated downward. And over time, the water table rose until it got within inches of the surface of the soil, and then it started evaporating into the atmosphere. The problem is that that water, like water almost everywhere, has some minerals and salts in it. And so they concentrated they don't evaporate with the water, they concentrate it on the surface of the soil, and this salt buildup eventually led to a decline in yields and ultimately the collapse of the civilization itself. We look at other civilizations like the Mayan civilization in Central America, where the, the problem there apparently was excessive deforestation and soil erosion that eventually led to uh, falling, um, um, shrinking harvest and the the decline of that civilization. I had long rejected the idea that our modern agriculture in the 21st century could be vulnerable to um, uh, some of these same, uh, same trends, but I, I now think not only that it, it is vulnerable, that, but that we're beginning to see some of the stresses um, on the system. And I'd like to talk about um, the, the origin of these stresses and, and what we need to, to do about them. First, a quick look at both these, the, the demand and supply sides of the food equation. Today, um, we're, a, we're adding about 80 million people a year, and that's been true now for, for some decades. This means that at the dinner table tonight, there were 219,000 people who were not there last night. And tomorrow night, there'll be another 219,000 people at the dinner table. So it's a relentless growth in, in human population that is, is um, expanding, steadily expanding the demand for food. 
Now, for a long time, population growth was essentially the only source of additional demand for food. But today we have a second source, and that is rising affluence. People are moving up the food chain in large parts of the world. The difference between someone living low on the food chain and someone living high on the food chain is essentially the difference between India, for example, and the United States. In India, average grain consumption, and I'll use round numbers, is about 400 pounds per year, which is roughly a pound per day. When you have only a pound per day, you have to consume most of that directly to keep body and soul together. In this country, where we consume 1,600 pounds of grain per year, I might have said per day a minute ago, and I meant per year, um, 1,600 pounds, but of that, we only consume maybe 150, 200 pounds directly in the form of bread, pastries, breakfast cereals. The great bulk of it we consume indirectly in the form of meat, milk, and eggs. So our total claim on the world's grain harvest is, is really um, very substantial. And the, the thing that is so interesting now is, is that the, the rise in affluence is generating as much additional demand as population growth. And we see this most dramatically in China, where there are 1.2 billion people um, moving up the food chain at an unprecedented rate. We've never had such a, such a large uh, uh, segment of humanity moving up the food chain so fast before. But China's only part of it. There are roughly three billion people in the world today who are moving up the food chain, consuming more grain-intensive livestock products, more meat, milk, and eggs. So we have today two very robust sources of additional demand, population growth and rising affluence. At the same time that we're facing record, a record rate of growth in the demand for grain, we're running into constraints on the supply side. One of these is water shortages. Another is soil erosion. And then there's climate change. And at the same time, a shrinking backlog of unused agricultural technology. That is, the farmers are catching up with the scientists. Let's look at water first. Water is now emerging as a major constraint on efforts to expand world food production. We see this in, in many parts of the world. But peak water is probably going to have a far greater effect on our future than peak oil. We can produce food without oil, but we cannot produce food without water. So water is, and, and peak water, which probably came two or three years ago. We don't know for sure because there are no reliable tabulations of data on water consumption for the world as a whole. We do know that roughly 80% of all water consumed in the world is for irrigation. So what happens to the water supply affects irrigation and food production. In one region of the world, we've seen dramatic declines in grain production because of overpumping and aquifer depletion. And that region is the Arab Middle East. It includes countries like Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, uh, a group of countries where grain production is declining. The production is declining fastest in Saudi Arabia because they, are, they have nearly depleted their underground water resources, the, the aquifers that they use for irrigation. And their irrigation water is essentially fossil water. That is, this is water that was put down eons ago. And these are, are fossil aquifers. So the production of grain is, is dropping in these countries. And the Saudis expect that by 2016, um, they'll essentially be out of the grain production business. Now, the Saudis have a population essentially the same as that of Canada. So it's, it's not an inconsequential 
uh, population that's going to have to be fed entirely with imported grain. We look at the big three grain producers, China, India, and the United States. These three countries account for roughly half of the world grain harvest. And each is, is having water difficulties, but in, in some cases, um, in the case of India, much more serious water problems than in either China or the United States. China historically relied heavily on surface water for irrigation. This is water from the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. Um, but recently, uh, particularly on the North China Plain, they've, they've become much more reliant on underground water. The problem with that is that the deep aquifer, which they're now pumping under the North China Plain, <clears throat> is a fossil aquifer. It does not replenish naturally. Um, the World Bank estimates that 130 million Chinese are being fed with grain produced by overpumping. In the US, we also are pumping a fossil aquifer for irrigation, and that's the Ogallala Aquifer that stretches from northern Texas through western Oklahoma into western Kansas. Um, and up to the southwestern corner of Nebraska. The Ogallala Aquifer is a fossil aquifer, and in Texas, um, which has been pumping this aquifer heavily for, um, for some decades now, the irrigated area has, has shrunk by 20 to 30 percent in recent decades. The same thing is happening in Oklahoma and in Kansas. The irrigated area in the western part of the state is also shrinking. Now, fortunately for us, these are not major grain producing regions. They're, they're, they're mostly producing wheat, and, and, and the productivity of the land does not come close to that in the Corn Belt. In the US Corn Belt, we have an extraordinarily productive um, piece of agricultural real estate. Just to put that in perspective, the state of Iowa produces more grain than Canada, and at the same time, more soybeans than China. That almost sounds as though I slipped a decimal point, but I, I didn't. Um, Iowa's just extraordinarily productive. So we're looking at tightening water supplies in the big three, to some degree in China, to some degree in the US. But for, for the US, it's not, a, it's not a big deal, because it only ir irrigated grain production is a very small part of the total. But in India, three-fifths of the grain harvest comes from irrigated land. And we have seen a very substantial growth in the grain harvest in India in recent years because of, of the number of irrigation wells being drilled. In India, you do not have to have a license to drill an irrigation well. The result is there are now 26 million irrigation wells in India pumping water to expand grain production. And as a result, the water table is falling in every state in India. The water table is falling and wells are starting to go dry. So we, we have created here in India a huge water-based food bubble. The estimate is that at least 160 million people in India are being fed with grain produced by overpumping. And, and that estimate is actually several years old now, so it's probably much greater than that. So in addition to shrinking water supplies in key agricultural countries, we are also now facing the effect of climate change on grain harvests. The generation of farmers on the land today is the first to face 
climate change. When I was farming 50, 60 years ago, we would have an occasional bad harvest because of drought or a heat wave or what have you. But it wasn't, it wasn't that, it wasn't of great concern because we knew that the next year things would probably go back to normal. Today, we face changes on an even larger scale, but there is no norm to go back to because the climate system is in a state of constant flux. Agriculture as it exists today evolved over an 11,000 year period of rather remarkable climate stability. And now suddenly, the climate system is changing. So with each passing year, the agricultural system and the climate system are more and more out of sync with each other. And this makes it obviously very difficult for farmers. The rule of thumb is that for each one degree Celsius rise in temperature during the growing season, we can expect a 10% decline in grain yields. One degree Celsius rise in temperature, 10% decline in grain yields. As temperature rises, photosynthesis um, sort of reaches a peak at about 68 degrees and stays there to about 95 degrees. So in that range, photosynthesis is stable. But when you go beyond 95 degrees, the photosynthetic activity begins to decline. When you hit 104 degrees, it ceases entirely and the plant goes into thermal shock. So when you get up in the 90s, each additional degree affects, has a meaningful effect on production. Another challenge that we face today in addition to water and climate change is soil erosion. Now soil erosion is not new. It, it, it began with when agriculture began. Um, but what's new today is the scale of soil erosion. In this country, during the 1930s, we experienced the Dust Bowl. It's part of our ecological history now. But we, we understood what was happening, and we had enough slack in our system that we could take some of that, some of that highly erodible land in the southern plains out of production and put it back in grass. And on the other, other land, we, uh, we went to strip cropping and other changes in agricultural practices to stabilize soils. So we got the situation under control. A generation later, in the 1960s, early 1960, the Soviet Union also experienced a dust bowl. This was the period when, uh, when Khrushchev was saying to the United States, that economically, he said, we will bury you. And they were planning to outproduce us in industry and agriculture across the board. But to do this in agriculture, they had to plow a lot of new land. And much of that land was in Kazakhstan. And much of it should never have been plowed in the first place because they created a dust bowl in just a matter of years. So they were forced to return some of that land to grass. And the, uh, the success of Soviet agriculture, now Russian and Ukrainian agriculture, in competing with the US has never really uh, materialized. The US is still very much um, the agricultural superpower in the world, not only dominating world grain exports, uh, but also being the world's leading producer of soybeans. Soybeans are not very visible, but soybeans, if you open your refrigerator door and you see milk and cheese and yogurt and, and some hamburger or steak or what have you, there are soybeans in all of those 
foods, all the, the livestock and poultry products. Because the standard rule of thumb in, in mixing feed, whether for pigs, chickens, or cows, is four parts grain, one part soybean meal. When you crush soybeans to get the oil, which is valuable in its own right, but the, you, and about 20% of the soybean is oil, the other 80% is meal. And that meal is now used throughout the world with grain in livestock and poultry um, feeds. So the soybean occupies an important position. And though most people do not know it, yet at least, we now have more land in the Western Hemisphere in soybeans than either wheat or corn. The Western Hemisphere being Canada all the way south through Argentina. One of the difficulties we have with soybeans is we're not very good at raising soybean yields. Since 1950, world grain yields have tripled, but soybean yields have increased um, moderately, but not nearly as much as grain yields. And the principal reason is that the soybeans being legumes fix their own nitrogen, so the yields do not respond to additional fertilizer use in the same way that grains do, for example. The good news is that given the, the huge demand for corn, and corn is now the world's leading grain, corn is number one, wheat number two, and rice a close number three. So with the, the big three grains, the two are food grains, wheat and rice, but the, the most important now is corn. And the reason it's so important is because there are so many people in the world who, who are moving up the food chain. So we have water shortages, climate change, soil erosion, two massive new dust bowls now forming, one in western China. This is a region where the government has lost control of livestock numbers. Um, let me just compare the US and China. The two countries have somewhat uh, similar grazing capacities. Each country has close to 100 million head of cattle, beef and dairy. The US has 9 million sheep and goats. China now has 282 million sheep and goats. And they simply don't have the grazing capacity to support this population. So the overgrazing is destroying grassland and converting grassland into desert on a huge scale. So we're having these huge dust storms now coming out of Western China on a scale we've not seen before. A similar thing is happening in the Sahelian region of Africa. In rural societies such as those in sub-Saharan Africa, as human population grows, so does the livestock population. So they move more or less um, at the same, at the same rates and, and follow the same trends. The problem is that we've now reached the point where the livestock population in Africa, particularly in the Sahelian region, is greatly exceeding the sustainable grazing capacity. The result is the grassland is being converted into desert and we have huge dust storms now coming out of that region on a scale that we've, we've not seen before. So in two important areas of the world, Western China and, and basically Central Africa from, from uh, uh, Senegal in the west to Somalia in the east, that whole belt across China of, of what was once reasonably good grazing land is now being converted into desert. The final, or the fourth, we have water shortages, climate change, soil erosion. The fourth constraint on efforts to expand the world grain harvest is a new one. And that is the, the, the glass ceiling, what I call the glass ceiling on grain yields that is represented by the capacity of photosynthesis. In raising grain yields, once you've eliminated the nutrient constraints, and once you've eliminated the moisture constraints, then the remaining constraint is photosynthesis. And unfortunately, we don't know how to, 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 to break through that glass ceiling 
represented by the capacity of photosynthesis. Roughly 40% of the world's grain harvest is now being harvested in countries with grains that, after decades of rising, have hit the, the sort of glass ceiling imposed by the limits of photosynthesis. So there's about roughly 40% of the world grain harvest that's no longer expanding because of this, of this limit. So these things are making it more difficult to expand production fast enough. So we have water shortages, climate change, soil erosion, and the glass ceiling. Now, what do we do about this? Well, one of the obvious things is we've got to get the brakes on population growth. We are currently scheduled to add 2 billion people between now and 2050. World population will go from 7 billion to 9 billion, according to the UN's demographic projections. I personally doubt that we're ever going to add another 2 billion people. We're having a lot of trouble feeding 7 billion. And we're hitting some of these constraints I've mentioned, like water and the glass ceiling and so forth. So we either will accelerate the shift to smaller families and avoid the 2 billion, part of that 2 billion projected increase in world population, or we'll fail to, and we will begin to see um, uh, mortality rates rise as a result of hunger and malnutrition. And one of the things we're seeing in the world today is a new um, phenomenon called foodless days. In low-income countries, the low-income segment within those countries, most of the people simply can't afford to eat every day. I think in, in, in Nigeria, it's something like 21% of all families now plan foodless days. That is, they get together on Sunday night and say, well, this week we won't, we won't eat on Wednesday and Saturday, for example. We'll eat the other five days, but we can't afford to eat every day. Uh, in Ethiopia, I think it may be 21%. In India, it's 20%. Peru, 14% of families now plan foodless days. So we're moving into a new, uh, a, a new era, one dominated by scarcity. And remember during the last half of the last century, surpluses were the big problem. We were always trying to figure out what to do with excess capacity. So we paid US farmers um, from 1950 up through um, 1990 or so to hold some of their land out of production so as not to have these unmarketable surpluses. But now in, this, in the United States, we're flat out. We can't produce any more than we, than we currently are. We've got all the land in production. I shouldn't say we can't produce more. We can't, we can't expand the cultivated area more. There are still places where we can expand production. So we're going to have to, I think, address the population issue and rethink population policy. And that means not just filling the family planning gap, though that obviously is, is part of it, but it means, it means eradicating poverty. And as has been pointed out by a number of people, including Jeffrey Sachs, the economist at Columbia University, we now have the resources to eliminate world poverty. We can do it. When you realize that we have a defense budget of $600 billion, and we have to ask ourselves, defense against what? Who's going to attack the United States? I mean, we may have terrorist problems, but, but you don't deal with terrorist problems with $600 billion budgets. Um, we, we have we're, we're developing ever more modern weapons systems. We're sort of in a race with ourselves. Other countries aren't investing very much in, in, the, in this area um, because 
I think increasingly people realize that the real threats to our security today are not military, they're not armed aggression. The real threats to our future are things like population growth and climate change and water shortages and soil erosion. These are the issues that are undermining our future and these are the ones we ought to be, ought to be devoting resources to, to dealing with. Getting the brakes on population growth and, er and eradicating poverty are very closely related. And, and eradicating poverty is, is very basic things. It includes uh, raising literacy levels, for example. It means school lunch programs in low-income countries to get children in school. We see, we see a situation where there are literally hundreds of millions of women in the world who want to plan their families but do not have access to family planning services and reproductive health care. But the cost of filling that family planning gap is so small that it would get lost in the rounding of the numbers for the U.S. defense budget. And yet, that family planning gap poses a very substantial threat to future world security. We have to get the brakes on population growth. And what do we do about water? I think we have to think about raising water productivity the same way we began roughly in 1950 about raising land productivity. Up until 1950, the growth in the world grain harvest came from expanding cultivated area. But then, beginning in the United States and Europe and, and, and even earlier in Japan, we began raising yields, began raising land productivity. The result is that the world grain yield per acre has tripled since 1950. We now need to think about raising water productivity. The interesting thing is we don't even have an indicator for measuring water productivity in agriculture. We talk about grain yield per acre or per hectare, but we, we, don't, we don't have anything like that to, to talk about. We know broadly that wheat is much more, uh, uses water much more efficiently than rice, for example. The, the water required to produce one ton of rice will produce two tons of wheat. Um, so there, there are possibilities um, in at least some parts of the world for shifting crops and, and increasing water efficiency. But we need also to, to think about the kinds of irrigation systems we use and make sure we're using the, the more water efficient um, technologies. And then if we're going to, if we're going to secure future food supplies, we're gonna to have to stabilize climate. We're gonna to have to bite the bullet on this issue. The, the goal now for the international community, one that's supported by many national governments, is to cut carbon emissions 80% by 2050. Now the nice thing about that goal is it's so far out there that no one really worries very much about it. But I think that future food security is probably going to require us to cut carbon emissions 80%, not by 2050, but by 2020. And this is going to take a mobilization, not unlike the mobilization in World War II. January 6, 1942, month after Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt laid out arms production goals. He said we're going to produce 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, thousands of ships. And I think most Americans at the time couldn't really sort of understand how that could happen. We were still uh, a depression mode economy when the war started. But one of the first things that Roosevelt did was to ban the sale of new cars. And what that, what that did, obviously, was force the automobile industry to start manufacturing tanks and planes. And there, there's footage of, 
of automobile plants in Detroit with tanks coming off the end of the assembly line. What we need to do today is to begin producing wind turbines on a huge scale. We have an abundance of wind. And, and we have some, some success stories here. Um, uh, the most exciting is China. The Chinese have now begun construction on seven wind mega complexes, each of which will have at least 20,000 megawatts of generating capacity. 20,000 megawatts, think of 20 nuclear power plant complexes. I mean, this is huge. The largest of the seven is in Inner Mongolia. When it is completed, it will have 38,000 megawatts of generating capacity. To put that in perspective, that one wind complex will produce enough electricity to run a country like Poland. It is huge. If I were to pick the two most exciting things happening in the world today on the climate front, this massive commitment to developing wind resources in China would be one. The other would be the closing of coal plants in the United States. And <laughs> this is being led by the Sierra Club. Many groups, organizations are working with the Sierra Club, but the Sierra Club is leading it. Um, you may have noticed, I think it's two weeks ago now, the Sierra Club announced that they had just closed the 150th coal plant in the United States. Now we've still got 460 to go or something like that, so we're not there yet, but their goal is to close every coal plant in the country. And I think they'll do it. I mean, it'll take some years yet, but they're moving clearly in the right direction. I think that's one of the most exciting things happening in, in the world today on the climate front, the other being this huge commitment to, to wind, um, developing wind resources in, in China. I don't think any gener generation has faced the kinds of issues that we are facing in the world today. What we're talking about is basically the future of civilization. We, we use the term, you know, saving the planet. The, the planet's going to be around for a long time. The question is whether we can save civilization. And given the trends we've set in motion um, with overplowing and overpumping and, 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 and with excessive carbon emissions and climate change and so forth, um, we're, we're in trouble as a civilization. And, and the challenge is to begin reversing the trends. And I mentioned um, a few of the things that are happening, like closing coal plants in the US and building wind farms in China. We're, we're beginning to see um, action on the scale that's needed. And the interesting thing about these two is they're very different. One is being led by an NGO in the United States. The other is being led by the, the government itself in China. And it happens that the US and China are the world's two leading sources of carbon emissions driving climate change. So these are important steps in the right direction. <clears throat> there are other things happening that are exciting too that are just beginning to unfold. One of these is the development of solar energy resources in the United States. Um, if you track these trends, you know that the number of rooftop solar installations to generate electricity um, for residential use has been climbing, climbing rapidly um, in the last year or two. I mean, it's been growing for some time, but it's, it's, the expansion is, is, is exceptionally rapid now. And what's happening is that the more homes have um, solar installations generating electricity on their rooftops, the smaller the market becomes for utility generated electricity. And th as that market becomes smaller, the utilities have to raise their prices because they still maintain the same infrastructure. 
It's just that, they, that their income from electricity sales is shrinking. So that they have to raise prices. And the more they raise prices, the more profitable it becomes to invest in rooftop solar, um, solar um, installations. And, and, and so we have a very positive feed, feedback loop operating here that's, that's going to lead to, um, I think, much more rapid sort of solarization of electricity generation in this country than most people um, anticipate. So there are some exciting things coming, but we've got a, we've got a lot to do. And the, the two big issues, if you want something to work on, the two big issues are stabilizing climate and stabilizing population. Um, I think I've I've uh, I've captured most of the um, the uh, the main points I wanted to uh, to make, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions you might have if um, um, if if that's in in order. And I think. Um. I didn't hear you directly address chemical-based agriculture, so I'm wondering how does that particular aspect of food production fit into your view of the problems and the solutions? The, um, the biggest use of chemicals in agriculture by far is in the form of fertilizer. Um, and, and what's happened um, in our society and indeed throughout most of the world is that we have disrupted the natural nutrient cycle. When I grew up on the farm, all the waste from the barn, for the chicken house, from, from, from our outhouse before we had um, indoor plumbing, all went back on the land. But once you get most of the people living in cities, you lose that option. It's not easy to get the nutrients back. And it's particularly difficult if you're growing wheat in Kansas or corn in Iowa that goes to Egypt or Japan or someplace halfway around the world and is consumed, you, it's almost impossible to get those nutrients back. Um, so one of the things that, that has happened is that urbanization has disrupted the nutrient cycle and, and particularly when, it, uh, when you have food moving internationally through international trade as, as much does today. Um, so it's we, we know um, what, what's happening, and, and we do know that there is potential for recycling uh, urban waste much more efficiently than we are at present. Um, I noticed that San Francisco recently was the first city to reach zero waste. That is, everything in San Francisco is being reused, recycled in some way. Um, and, and that should be, should be the goal everywhere. I mean, if San Francisco can do it, um, probably other, other cities can as well. The difference between San Francisco and other cities is that they've worked at it much harder and much longer in San Francisco. But once they've done it, then it makes it easier for other cities to do the same. But the, the, because we've become so highly urbanized, um, we've created the, the nutrient movement in, in uh, flow into cities um, and, and sometimes halfway around the world. And if you can't get those nutrients back, then you, you, have, to use, you have to use anhydrous ammonia or ammonium nitrate or some other form of nitrogen to get, of, of chemical nitrogen to get it, get it back into the soil. The nitrogen, incidentally, whether it comes from, from uh, uh, ammonium nitrate or from, um, from soybeans fixing nitrogen. The nitrogen is the same. It's identical. Um, the problem is how to get it. And, and we, you know, the, the atmosphere is filled with nitrogen. Nitrogen is the principal gas that, that we breathe, actually. We, it, we don't get anything from it, but it's, it's, it's here. So there's, it's not that there's a lack of nitrogen uh, around. It's, it's getting it in the soil where we need it, when we need it. That's the challenge. And I always feel when I, when I hear folks, all of us talk about how we're going to deal with climate change, and, and of course we need to deal with uh, it in terms of finding alternative forms of energy, but I always am concerned in those alternative forms of energy having such embedded amounts of energy just to produce them as well, and how that uh, is basically allowing us to be comfortable in our, in our current consumptive habits. I think one of the, obviously one of the important things to do is to try and conserve 
um, the energy that we use currently and also reduce it just in our behavior. So I think behavioral change, first and foremost, should be the thing on our radar. Um, and to be aware of the fact that uh, producing large wind farms and um, you know, obviously reducing coal-fired power plants is a good thing, but uh, photovoltaic uh, operations on a massive scale requires a lot of energy to, to create that too. So maybe we should stop using you know, so many iPods and computers, et cetera. But really what I want to ask you is that um, I appreciate so much uh, the civic involvement of organizations like yours and CR Club, et cetera, as you say, um, the pressure that we can put upon uh, governments uh, to, do, to have real change. Um, I'm wondering, uh, as an agroforester, as a tropical agroforester, and I appreciate the commentary about the planting trillion trees, um, certainly the, the, your primary uh, concern in the beginning of the, your discussion was about soil and water and climate. And obviously trees um, have a, a, a beneficial, a mutative effect upon all that. And so um, I'm wondering that traditional agroforestry systems that came from low-income countries, um, they, they still exist. There's a retention of trees uh, to provide all those benefits. And, but in high-income countries, such as the United States, I see very little in the way of uh, policy, farm bill, obviously, um, in terms of how we can either retain the trees that are left on the landscape uh, or integrate trees into an agricultural landscape. We talk a lot about the restoration of, of deteriorated ecosystems. Obviously, that's great. Uh, we talk about uh, increasing uh, productivity on strictly agricultural lands that are devoid, perhaps, of trees, like in Iowa. Um, I'm wondering, from your point of view, I imagine that you may be in agreement, but how would organizations like yours and others in the United States pressure the USDA Farm Bill um, uh, representatives in our Congress to actually start uh, motivating and thinking about how trees can be incorporated into our agricultural systems for all the co-benefits that they provide. Thanks. The, um, the Conservation Reserve Program, which is the, 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 the program where farmers are, are paid to hold erodible land out of production, and they have to plant it either in grass or trees, and I, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but probably at least 90% of the land goes in grass. And I think it's partly because farmers are reluctant to make the long-term commitment of land use that's associated with trees. They, they, they lose the capacity to, to plow it if, you know, if, if food prices go up dramatically. Um, so I've, I've noticed this sort of built-in psychological bias in favor of, of grass and and and, uh, and 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 very little in, in support of planting trees, but what I think we need to do is to is to do some sort of cost benefit analysis of planting trees so we can see all the benefits associated with with trees. It's not just lumber or firewood. It's soil conservation. It's climate stabilization. It's a lot of things. But we 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 don't have. Uh, much in the way of full cost accounting on 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 planting trees, which is one of the things I think would would greatly strengthen the 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 argument for planting a lot more trees than we do. Yes, especially in pasture lands, I think where uh, you know you could reduce uh, the evapotranspiration. I mean, it depends upon the type of system that you create with the utilization of trees. It doesn't mean you have to plant trees and and have a competitive disadvantage to the crops, including grasses that you're growing around there. But if you do it in a smart way, um, you could be able to actually increase your yield as a whole on per acre or per hectare. So yeah, thank you. I hope you uh, are able to help us out with that. Well, thank you for your input as a professional in the field. Thanks. I first uh, discovered uh, your organization uh, about uh, three years ago with the publication of your book, uh, World on the Edge. And uh, following that, I contacted the Institute and uh, purchased about 25 of, the, of those books and then gave them to uh, both friends and family and to local legislators and people that were running for office. Um, hoping that, you know, you scatter a lot and maybe s some of it will stick. Uh, 
And, and I've uh, also tried to persuade the national networks, um, particularly MSNBC, which seems to be the most environmental friendly, mm -hmm. to interview you and to begin a series of discussions um, that would elevate the, the issue in the minds of the people who need to have it elevated most, and that's in the, the national uh, Congress and in our state legislature, uh, well, all the state legislatures. And I'm wondering, I guess my question is, if, if it could be arranged for you to uh, come back and, and uh, make an address or, or to field questions or something to our state legislature, would that be uh, something you would be interested in doing? We have a, a, a governor who's very pro-environmental uh, consciousness and uh, very concerned about climate change. Um, I, w I would be uh, delighted to come back and talk or testify or um, whatever. Um, the, the only constraint is the amount of time that I have and the, the global constituency that we're trying to reach. I mean, um, people think book tours, they think the U.S., which is obviously an important country and, and it's what I'm doing now but the book's going to be published in probably 28 other languages. Um, and, and I'll try to do book tours in at least some of those countries. So my time becomes the scarcest resource that, that I have. But to the extent that I can, that I can, can, can testify or, or address key groups of decision makers, I'll, I'll, I'll try, certainly. Well, that, that, that was my hope in that if we could get one state, and I think uh, Washington State is perhaps in a pivotal place, you know, like that watershed point that you were talking about earlier, that like one, once the domino starts, that other states might uh, be quickly to come along and we could be a leader. So, yep. Thank you. I quite agree. Once one state does something, it becomes much easier for other states to, to do it as well. Yes, um, I'm the last question. <laughs> A number of uh, respected scientists feel that GMO technology is currently promoted is not safe for people or our biosphere. And it's actually bad science presented as acceptable science. And I was just wondering, what is your thoughts on six mega corporations controlling more of our, and more of our agricultural systems through GMO technology? It concerns me in many ways. I mean, one, it's, it's sort of a threat to democracy in a sense. Uh, you know, I, and and it represents a concentration of power, not just in this country, but internationally. I mean, you know, we developed a, a set of, you know, national governments, you know, for a reason and now, um, in, in some cases, um, and this is not the only uh, uh, example, but the, uh, the, uh, the oil companies, uh, you know, feel as though they have the right to do almost anything they want, whether it's building pipelines uh, or tapping new potentially risky sources of energy or what have you. Um, and it takes, it takes an informed... Uh, and organized electorate. I mean, the, the, the term has come up a few times tonight, the need to organize and organize more effectively. Um, these, are, these are serious challenges, and they're a new kind of challenge that we've not faced before. And, and because they are new and, and, and often fairly technical in nature, not that many people understand them. Um, and and, and that, may, that also makes it, it difficult. So I, I don't have any... Any, any ready answer to how we deal with this. I know it's a problem, and, and, and if enough of it recognizes it as a problem, we may be able to do something about it. I mean, just to give an example, you would think that the U.S. Department of Agriculture would have a major research program on the effect of genetic, genetically modified crops. Wouldn't you? Yeah. They don't. And yet they're the organization, I mean, that's supported with taxpayer money that's supposed to be looking out for our interests um, as taxpayers, and they're not doing a very good job. So just letting them know that um, would, would be a, a, a useful thing to do.
I, I want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for coming out. And I wanted to mention one thing that I had forgotten to mention earlier, and that is we are seeing in the youth culture in this country uh, some dramatic uh, shifts in, in values. For example, um, the National Association of Automobile Dealers became quite alarmed recently when they realized that young people were not buying cars in, in the way that their parents' generation had. And that's true. And it's, it was also interesting that NASCAR, in looking at the films of its races, suddenly realized that, that almost all the people who come to NASCAR races have hair the color of mine. And, and they, they realized their young people are not part of the car culture in the way that our earlier generations were. And, and this, is, uh, this, I see, is a very healthy development. Um, and, and it represents a shift in thinking about mobility and how, how people get around. Uh, the growth of bike sharing programs in this country we haven't touched on tonight, but it's, it's an extraordinarily exciting development. I think by the end of this year, there will be 100 cities in the US with bike share programs, um, and, and, and that helps to diversify the transport system to, to, to provide one of the cleanest sources of transportation that we, um, that we have. So there, there, there are a lot of things happening that are, that are encouraging and beginning to move in, in the right direction, and our challenge is to recognize these and, and, and help move them um, along even faster. And I, I thank you all for coming out tonight and we'll keep pushing until eventually, like the Berlin Wall, some of these things will, will go down. Thank you. <laughs>